So what happens when you die? What happens when you die? If you have, haven't had your eyes closed all week, you know that eight days ago on a field in the west of Israel, uh, just close to the Gaza Strip, a few thousand young people drinking, dancing the night away. They were at a rave, a music festival. It was called a peace festival. There was a a large statue of Buddha there in Israel and uh, electronic trance music played, a lot of drinking, a lot of drug taking going on and a lot of free love available. People had come from all over the world to this event. But then on Saturday, the sun rose and as the sun rose, Rockets began to rain down, and Hamas terrorists turned up, and they began what can only be called a massacre, a massacre. At least 260 people, young people, died there in those fields. Many, many more were injured, all of them traumatized, along with the whole nation of Israel and really the, the whole world, anyone who has a heart feels the, the, the horror of what happened there. You couldn't help but be moved. Um, it wasn't even only, the only massacre that took place that day. More than 1,300 people were murdered in Israel in a single day. And there are still many unaccounted for. One of them who was there at the festival, one of those party goers, um, spoke about the horror of it all and, and he said he just wanted to wake up out of the nightmare. Can you enter into that a little bit? He said it was the best party of his entire life. He said suddenly it all went from paradise to hell. Thankfully, he's still alive to tell the tale. So he didn't go to hell, did he? But his words have been just ringing in my ears. And as I've gone on the whole week trying to prepare a message for today, I've realized that everything I had was inappropriate. And um, I really need to speak to you about hell. Hell is a word people have been using a lot just this week. Jordan Peterson, if you know of him, tweeted to the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, give them hell. Israel has certainly been raining fire down, uh, fiery judgment down on Gaza in, in recent days. I've seen pictures of people being dragged out of the rubble, and I've seen some of those pictures accompanied by um, a meme that says, they wanted hell, now they've got it. People fleeing the north of Gaza under instruction to evacuate um, were met just yesterday with some attack on the road and um, the headline today in one British newspaper is, escape to hell. In Israel today, by the way, there are about 1,500 bodies of Hamas terrorists who went there deliberately with instructions to murder, to rape, to torture civilians. Men, women, children, many of them filmed themselves doing it. And, and the eyewitnesses reported that some of them were laughing, some of them were grinning. They were enjoying and celebrating their acts of terror. I've seen videos of them jubilant, celebrating as they hurried home to Gaza on, with pickup trucks packed full of stuff, loot that they were taking home uh, along with the bodies alive or dead of their 
hostages. One video, one of those videos, shows uh, the helicopter camera footage at night time of some of those motorcycles arriving back at the border with Gaza. And then there is the expected explosion and those jubilant motorcycle terrorists disappeared at the hands of an Israeli hellfire missile. Where are they now? Did, did they go to hell? Do, do you believe in hell? We use the word hell a lot, don't we? And um, apart from in church anymore, I don't know if you've noticed that, it's actually um, become almost impossible for preachers to pronounce that word in a church. Um, if, if Jesus was here today, if he was here and responding to what has happened, um, if we could ask him, what, what would you say, Jesus, about this? What would he say? Actually, we don't have to ask, do we? Because um, we have in front of us, I just read to you a moment in Jesus's life, a moment when people came up to him and told him about a massacre. And he responded. And I think the best thing I can possibly do today is to walk you through what Jesus said. So that is my plan. This is, there is a lot that could be said, isn't there, about Especially at this moment, a lot could be said about what, what has happened. People are talking everywhere about prophecy. They're talking about war. They're talking about evil. They're talking about um, rumors of wars and all sorts of concerns that people have. And my, my burden um, today is actually not to address all of those things. I have a burden just to unpack these verses in Luke chapter 13. I think that um, his response, Jesus' response at a moment like this is going to be more valuable than anything else I could say right now. So if you're following with me, please look at the passage in Luke chapter 13 and verse, verses 1 to 5. Look at it on the page. Just to give you an overview, there are if you're, as you're looking at it, there are two rounds of teaching here. First, um, and people come in verse 1 and tell Jesus about a massacre. And then in verse 2, Jesus starts to tackle their misunderstanding. And in verse 3, he gives them his message. And there's another round of teaching in verses 4 and 5. In verse 4, it's Jesus who raises with, with them, a notable catastrophe. And then in verse 4, still, he questions them to highlight their confusion. And then finally, in verse 5, he repeats his message and he, in the context of the catastrophe to give them some more correction. So um, five verses, two rounds of teaching, massacre, misunderstanding, and message in, in verses 1, 2, and 3. And then catastrophe, confusion, and correction in verses 4 and 5. Let's start just in verse 1 with the report of the massacre. There were some present at that very time who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And to understand the context of this, you, you really um, just, it's worth thinking about those, those people who were and I quote, present at that very time. They had obviously heard Jesus talking, uh, saying what he was saying in chapter 12 in Luke. If you look back at that, in chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus spoke about casting fire upon the earth, having come to cast fire upon the earth. And then in verse 54, all the way through to verse 56, in chapter 12, he's warning them because they could take warnings from the, the heavens. They could take warnings from the sky about the coming weather, but they didn't seem able to understand the implications of the time that they were in and what that would mean for them. 
if you cast your eyes over verses 57 to 59 in chapter 12, it's pretty obvious he's, he's, taking, he's talking about the time when you meet your judge, and he's trying to prepare them for that moment. Well, my point is that as you look back at that context, my point about the context is it was all perhaps all that talk about judgment that made some of them bring up the massacre that had just happened. Anyway, uh, now, now they give him their report of the massacre, and it says in verse 1, they told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, we don't know which massacre he was talking, they were talking about, because that kind of thing seemed to happen a lot. And um, Pontius Pilate this, the, is the Roman governor of that region, Judea. Uh, this is the same guy, the same Pilate who went on to wash his hands and say, I'm innocent of this man's blood just before he hands over Jesus to be crucified, having said he's innocent, but yes, I'm going to crucify him. I'm going to crucify him anyway to try and get myself out of this major confrontation with the Jews in Jerusalem, another major confrontation with the Jews in Jerusalem for Pilate. Um, there's this Pilate who had actually made such a mess of his governorship in, in Judea that he, by the time he crucified Jesus, he was already in a lot of trouble. He'd been appointed the governor by the Roman emperor Tiberius back in AD 26, and so he's been governor now, about this time, for at least about six years. And he'd managed to really upset the Jews on numerous occasions and made a mess. Um, instead of winning hearts and minds, uh, he'd marched his troops into Jerusalem, carrying the Roman standards, which the Jews saw as idols. And when they saw that, they rioted. And he said, I'm going to kill you if you don't stop rioting. And they said, all of them, Okay, kill us then. <laughs> he had to back down. He was humiliated. Uh, another occasion, um, uh, the, the, another occasion, they, uh, they 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 rioted again. He'd used the temple funds to pay for infrastructure work in Jerusalem, and, and they rioted. And this time, he did massacre them. Um, and not everything is recorded, but that kind of thing was going on. He was weak, he was indecisive, and yet Pilate, Pontius Pilate, capable of incredible cruelty. And, and, and that's actually what had obviously happened. We don't know which massacre is being talked about here, but some, one of those massacres um, had happened, and Pontius Pilate had obviously sent his troops into the temple and massacred these people, these people from Galilee, while they were offering their sacrifices. The temple is the only place you can offer sacrifices, and so you have to picture that holiest place for the Jewish nation being invaded by Gentile soldiers and people butchered while they're in the act of worshiping God in their way and you just got to stop and think. <laughs> Talk about winning hearts and minds. Talk about how to insult, how to incite, how to stir up a nation to, to grief and to an outpouring of anger. I can actually understand why there are not records of this because I think Pontius Pilate would have been very keen at this point to make sure that nobody back in Rome ever heard about what he did. But now can you just picture the shock? Well, you, you can, can't you? Because we're, we're, we're witnessing the shock, the horror, the overwhelming anger and, 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 and grief of a nation at this violation. Do you think there was a lot Jesus could have talked about at that moment? He could have talked about anything. Come the Jews, and they tell him about this. What are you going to say, Jesus? 
Jesus does something really shocking at this point. Uh, let's look at it. They've told him about the massacre. Jesus doesn't focus on so much that could be said. Apparently for him, it's more important to deal with a misunderstanding, their misunderstanding. Let's talk about their misunderstanding now in verse 2. He, he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? Now, that may strike you as, as kind of odd, does it? Does it great that people would think like that? It's actually very common to think that other people are worse sinners somehow because they suffered in this way. That is actually the theology of karma. And I call it the theology of karma anyway. I don't know what other people call it. What goes around comes around. That's the idea. They died early. They died in this way. They suffered in this way. Why? Because they they must have done something bad, right? That's the basic theology of karma. Other people live long and prosper, and they have not, not so much suffering. Why? Because they must have done something good. Somewhere, somehow, there's a force. Maybe you call it God, people will say to you. But whatever it is, this thing punishes you for bad stuff. And these guys, well, these guys, they really suffered terribly. So they must have sinned terribly, right? So they were worse sinners than all the other Galileans. I call it the theology of karma. You could think of it, perhaps, if you're old enough, as the theology of the sound of music in reverse. You think of Maria, and she finds herself in love with Captain Von Trapp. And she thinks it's pretty cool. I'm going to get married. So she sings, somewhere in my youth or childhood, what? I must have done something good. This is the theology of karma. I must have done something good. And so now this, is, this wonderful thing is happening to me. Do you think like that? Do you, do you fall into thinking like that? A lot of people think like that. Um... That the logical extension of that kind of thinking is that the worst things happen to people because they are the worst. Worse sinners than all the other Galileans. The point to understand here is that according to Jesus now, this is a misunderstanding. And he's going to fix it. His message is really quite very Stark, so let's look at his message. Thirdly, in this first round, let's look at his message. In verse 3, he says, No, I tell you, no, that's that first part. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The first thing to notice is Jesus' is very straightforward authority, authority. He just tells them, no. And then he says, I tell you. <laughs> Actually, we need someone to tell us, don't we? We need someone to tell us with authority, this is actually how it is. There are all sorts of opinions, all sorts of ideas. I'm just going to say to you, friend, if you're here and you're just inquiring, and you're wondering, you need to come to a conclusion about the authority of Jesus to make statements like this. I mean, Jesus says all kinds of things like this. A truly, truly, I say to you, you've heard it said, dot, dot, dot. But I say to you, says Jesus. I mean, who is Jesus to say stuff like that? That's a really important question to answer, isn't it? And people could hardly handle his authority. Jesus, as Matthew puts it, he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes do. That's Matthew 7, 29. And I'm just going to say, I'm not going to argue for this, but I'm just going to say, look, I'm persuaded. I, I, I believe Jesus has the authority. When he says it, I can't prove or disprove it. 
but I'm persuaded that he is trustworthy, and I, I believe you can be too. That's a, a question for you to answer if you haven't already answered it. Jesus spoke like nobody else. He claimed to be from God. He claimed to speak the words from God. He claimed to be speaking for God. Actually, he was God, the Son, and he, he spoke as God. And he could just say, I tell you, and there was truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and, and claims like that which you either have to believe or you have to reject. And Jesus now is saying, no, no. That, that way of thinking, that is not it. And, and his message is, is quite different. His message is, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Unless you repent. We need to think about that, don't we? Let's talk about repentance just for a moment. Repent, repent is the word metanoeo in Greek. It's a complete change of mind, thinking. Obviously, a complete change of mind and thinking involves, includes a change of, change of mind about sin, about what you, you, you hated previously, loving what you hated and, and hating what you loved as far as sin is concerned. And if you're truly sorry about what you didn't used to care about. That's a change of mind, wouldn't you say, wouldn't it? If you're willing at last to confess what you used to cover up, it's a change of mind. All of those things are included in this radical, complete change of mind that the Bible calls repentance, meta not eto. It's going to impact, obviously, what you do as well. If, if you have this total change of mind, Genuine metanoia, that's the word for repentance, the noun, it's a complete change of mind. It's always going to include a sorrow for sin, a confession of sin, but also a turning from sin, isn't it? You're going to, you're going to actually stop doing what you now hate. You may fall into it, but there's a big difference between someone who loves to do it and someone who hates to do it. It's very simple. There's going to be a huge and evident difference in somebody's life. Um, if you completely change your mind, Jesus says now in effect, if you, if you completely change your mind, you won't perish. If you don't completely change your mind about your sin, if you don't do that, you are going to perish too, like them. And that's the big shocker in this message, isn't it? This is, this is Jesus's message. You, you, you all like to think it would never happen to you, right? Everyone thinks like that. You, somebody gets sick and, and you're like, um, wow, uh, t tell me about it. And they say, I just never thought it would happen to me because we just don't think like that. But Jesus says, oh, but yes, this if you don't repent, you will all likewise perish. What does he mean when he says perish? This is not a technical term. It can be used to mean simply being destroyed. It can be used to talk about just dying. But in the context of Jesus' teaching about heaven and about hell, he used the word perish to speak about the opposite outcome of eternal life. The opposite outcome of eternal life. He, he, used, the, he used the word in, in John chapter 10. You know that passage in John chapter 10 about the, the good shepherd and Jesus says in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And then in verse 28 he says, I give them what? Eternal life. And they will never perish. All right, it's speaking about the opposite outcome to eternal life. It's perishing. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's just too good to leave out, isn't it? John, John 5, 
John chapter 5, verse 24, Jesus said, Truly, truly, another one of these amen, amen statements of Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, listen, has, present tense, now, you believe his word, you hear his word, you believe him who sent him, you believe the gospel, you respond to it, you have eternal life. That's what Jesus said. And then he said this, he does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now here there's a contrast between eternal life on the one hand and coming into judgment on the other. So we're, we're adding up these contrasts. With, so eternal life, perishing. Eternal life, coming into judgment. L last year, I took my family to Capernaum. Capernaum, I, I would encourage you, if you ever get to go to Israel, go to Israel. Just not this week, um, but go to Israel. I'm hoping we'll lead a tour there one day. Um, I'm hoping to go in January in preparation for leading a tour there one way just to persuade you that I'm serious. Um, but if we go there, we're going to go to Capernaum. I took my family there last year and we stood just above the synagogue that Jesus would have preached in. First century synagogue has had another synagogue built on top of it. You can go and visit that. And, and just there to the side of those synagogues that are built on top of each other, um, you can walk around the back and you can see what must have been a millstone factory because they're just millstones, loads of them, and, and some of them partly finished. And so you can picture the people who finally put down their tools. I don't know why, probably the Romans um, wiping them out. And they just left all the millstones there. And you can look at these millstones, huge hunks of rock. And, um, it's a poignant place to go. Jesus was teaching. It's recorded in Mark 9, 42. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him, listen, to ha if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Well, that's pretty stark, isn't it? Jesus is a, a preacher who isn't afraid of startling your sensibilities. Verse 43 gets worse. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Now, he doesn't say throw it away here. That's recorded in the other gospel. But he does say throw it away elsewhere. It, listen, Mark 9, 43. It is better for you to enter life. What's that talking about? Obviously talking about eternal life, entering life, crippled, than with two hands to go to where? What does it say? Hell. Hell, Gehenna, the place of burning, speaking about a valley just to the south of Jerusalem where they took the rubbish out, Topheth, where they sacrificed their children in days gone by. The Jews turned it into a, 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 a rubbish dump. And the fires in that rubbish never went out. The burning, the burning, the burning, the defilement, there it was never ending. That's the place that gave the name to the place that you can go after death. And Jesus then describes it. Then with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Unquenchable. Have you been burned? Have any of you had something on you burning? Have you managed to quench it? What would it be like? Can you even begin to imagine the burning that cannot be quenched? 
Jesus is alarming, isn't he? Jesus is talking to us, to you, and he's saying, look, sin is so serious. If your hand is causing you to sin, chop it off. Don't go to hell where the fire just burns and burns and burns. That's literally what he was saying. Now, I think he was not literally telling you to cut off your hand. But he's, he's talking about a place, right? He's talking about a thing, a thing that he calls Gehenna, that he calls hell, a place of burning. And he says it again in verse 45. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. That's radical, radical action, isn't it? Not just, not just put it out, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God. So, you get, so you've got life, life, now the kingdom of God. That's the parallel. The opposite to the kingdom of God, the opposite to life, the opposite to eternal life is what? Hell. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Now Jesus explains what it's like. He was already talking, talking he's already been talking about where the fire is not quenched. It, you, you'd say ongoing burning. Now he says, where their worm does not die. And the fire is not quenched. Now listen, people have asked whether the fire of hell is, is really not just something that consumes you. And then you are consumed and it's all over. In other words, you're destroyed by it. Or if it is indeed eternal. It's the last verses here that, that, that can help solve it for you. It says, their worm. Their worm does not die. You go to hell, that's your worm. I don't think it's a literal worm. I, I, I don't know whether it's literal fire. These are, these are possibly pictures. What they talk about is, is, is just inconceivable. Could well be literal fire. I don't know. But it's fire that's not quenched. It's a worm that doesn't die. When Jesus told the story about the rich man and Lazarus in Luke chapter 16, the rich man ends up in the fire and he's conscious. And, and, and he says, I'm in torment. When Jesus taught about the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, in Matthew chapter 25, 46, he talks about the goats. These will go away into eternal, eternal punishment. But the righteous into eternal life. Well, now we've got an even more re remarkable and scary and altogether horrific contrast, eternal life. On the one hand, life. On, on the other hand, judgment, perishing, fire, punishment, eternal life, eternal punishment. There are only two options, there's only two places. It's all Jesus taught. There's no purgatory. There's no third way. There's no reincarnation. In, in the New Testament letters, Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, 18, says, talking about the message of the cross and salvation through Jesus on the cross, he says the, that message, the, the word of the cross, is folly to those who are perishing. It's like, it's a, it's a joke to them. 
This is just foolishness to them. Jesus dying on the cross, all those Christians saying, Jesus died for my sins, all those Christians. It's foolishness to the people who are perishing. They're going to hell. You can, you can kind of tell they're going to hell because they just think that the whole thing's a joke. But to us who are being saved, he says, to us it is the power of God. That's the message of the cross. So, so what do you think Jesus means? What do you think he means um, by perishing? That's the question, isn't it? What does he mean by perishing? I'm saying he, he means hell. He means conscious eternal punishment. What happens when you die? You go either to heaven to be with Christ or you go to hell. Listen, um, that destiny is awaiting every single person in this room, one or the other. Jesus is saying to you, I'm saying to you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That is Jesus' message. That is what's waiting for you, unless you repent. Friend, can I just plead with you? Maybe you're, you're that person who hears this every week. Maybe you're, you're just kind of immune to this. Maybe you've grown up with this. And you know in the back of your mind you have sins that you have been covering up, you've been holding on to. There is stuff you will not confess. There is stuff that you, 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 nobody even knows about it. And you just like, I, there's no way I could ever face up to what I've done. Listen, you will face up to what you've done. You will either face up to what you've done in this life now and repent, or you will face up to what you've done after this life. But that's hell. That's not where you want to go. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time for you to bow the, the knee and confess and seek, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, you have an opportunity. I'm pleading with you. Repent. Hear Jesus' message. Seek the Lord. Find salvation. Now, a major objection to all of this is, what about all the innocent people? What about all the innocent people? Now we're going to have round two in Jesus' response. Two rounds of response. We've dealt with round one. Now round two. Jesus is on his final journey to Jerusalem here. He's on his way, set his face steadfastly to Jerusalem. He's teaching his disciples. He's teaching the people as he goes. He's heading south. By the way, there's a big difference back in those days between the Jews in the south and the Jews in the north. All those rough northerners up there in Galilee with them northern accents from Galilee like Jesus had. Those people right up there, they were the rough sinners as far as those refined educated people from the south were concerned. Did you notice that in the, uh, the, the, the kind of question that Jesus gave them in verse 2? Did you notice him mentioning the Galileans? Were those worse sinners than the other Galileans? The other Galileans, those other people from up there in the north? Now Jesus is going to take the argument to them They've come to him with a question. Now he's going to take the argument to them with an illustration from a catastrophe. A catastrophe. Verse 4. He brings this up. Or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. 
And now this is a catastrophe. We don't, again, we don't know. It's not recorded elsewhere outside of this passage in Scripture and nothing that's been discovered anyway. Um, but it's Siloam. It's in the south of Jerusalem. Um, if you go through Hezekiah's tunnel, you kind of come out there by the pool of Siloam in that area just south of uh, the, the city of David. And uh, it, it's just... Something happened there. A tower fell. Um, quite possibly, some suggest it's, it was um, one of the infrastructure works that Pilate robbed the temple treasury for uh, to, was to build an aqueduct to come in to bring water into Jerusalem. An aqueduct would have required a big tower. And people have suggested maybe one of those fell. Whatever it was, at this point, it was an accident. It was a catastrophe. It, it wasn't an act of merciless slaughter. It wasn't a massacre. It was just people were there. Maybe they were the workmen working on the tower. Something went wrong. The tower fell. 18 of them died. The point is, it's an act of God. This is the classic innocent victim scenario, isn't it? These are just the people. They're just going about their work. They just Maybe someone lived there in a house, and it just fell on them. A tower falls. All sorts of people can be caught up in it. Galilee, um, Galilee in the first example that they gave to Jesus, Galilee is the despised place with all those worse kind of sinners up there in the north, the, the sinners of the rougher sort we down here in Jerusalem can all look down upon. Um, now, that was probably spoken, it was probably brought up by Jerusalemites, which is why, those, why they spoke about them as the people of Galilee. But um, the tendency is, isn't it, to, to always look down upon others, to always think that it's not going to happen to us, to think, you know, um, God wouldn't do something like that. God wouldn't let something like that happen to people like us, would he? I mean, a massacre. That's for those sinners, isn't it? And were they the worst kind of sinners, Jesus? It wouldn't have, God wouldn't let that kind of thing happen to refined people like 21st century Londoners, would, would he? Like people in the West who have education and culture and civilization and a Christian heritage in our country. God wouldn't let something like war happen to us. That's just for those people over there somewhere in Eastern Europe. Oh, Ukraine, was it? That was, was, that, was that where the war was going on? Or, or Israel, those Middle Eastern people that look different. Well, Nigeria, those people who, who the, the media and everyone else forgets. It's just it's, all the, it's always the other people, isn't it? But God wouldn't let something like that happen to us. And Jesus is going to bring it a bit closer to home. And he's talking about Jerusalemites. He's saying to, and he's talking about an act of God. And, and there's just people caught up in it. And I think this is what Jesus is pointing to with his question. Do you, here's the question. And he's going to, He's going to point out now their confusion. This is the second part of the second round. Uh, the, the confusion. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? All the others who lived in Jerusalem. Well, the word offenders is ophelitai. Ophelitai in Greek, ophelo, I owe, um, these are people who are debtors. These are people who have something they have to pay. The picture here is the, of the, that Jesus is, is saying, do you think that those people who were caught up in that tower that fell, somehow do you think that they somehow were worse debtors? They owed God more. They had to pay God for their sins. Were they worse debtors, listen, than all the other people in Jerusalem? They're all the Jerusalemites. I think he is pointing to them. And he's saying, you people who think this could never happen to you, what about them? He's picking the example that included the innocent victims as people would see them. And he's saying, well, 
Jesus' question at this point is, why does a tower fall on innocence? We are always tempted, aren't we, to think other people deserve it, but we don't. Now comes the correction, verse 5. It's the same. I don't need to go through it all. It's exactly the same. No, I tell you, unless you repent, unless you Jerusalemites who think that you're okay, that it would never happen to you, that this, this kind of catastrophe, this kind of massacre, this is for other people, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. There are no innocents. That's Jesus' message. There are no innocents. There are no people, actually, who don't have a debt to pay to God. This is, this is biblical, right? I mean, this is actually what the Bible teaches. That, that you, and you know it, don't you? Because you know in your conscience, you have sinned. We always like to think somewhere out there there's innocent people. But let's just talk about you. You have sinned. You knew it was wrong. You went ahead and did it anyway. You heard your conscience warning you. you. You just stubbornly brushed your conscience aside and you pressed on. And then you pressed on some more. And then you thought, well, blow it. I've done it now. Let's do it again. And you thought, well, quick, let me just not think about this and do it some more before I have to repent. And so it went on. And, and God saw and God knows and you have a debt to pay. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. Not Mother Teresa, not one. Not you. The wages of sin then is what? Death. But what you've got to pay, what you've got to come to you, is death. And he's not just talking about you dying, he's talking about you perishing. He's talking about hell. The wages of sin is, is hell. The contrast with that is the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is salvation, but look, if you will not repent, unless you repent, you will all, every single one of you, likewise perish. People say, what about the children? I'm not talking about children, I'm talking to you, you're adults, right? Jesus wasn't talking about children, he was talking to the the people in front of him who asked this question. Now, the Bible does talk about children. And just for the record, I don't think you can repent until you are conscious and you, you, you are able to see that you're culpable, that you actually are um, responsible for your sins. And you, that takes a certain amount of mental maturity. Just for the record, the Bible does indicate, I think, clearly that those who die, those young children who die before they could possibly understand that, are taken from their body into the arms of their Savior. John MacArthur, if this is an issue for you, it was an issue for us. We've, we have a family waiting for us in heaven. Um, but if it's an issue for you, 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 you can know that there's a great book out there, Safe in the Arms of God, that lays out this argument clearly. That, that, that takes care of the whole question of what about the children? I'm, I'm going to say the Bible's clear about that. David said, I will go to him, but he will not come to me. David expected to see his, his um, now dead child again, but, but not, not by him coming back, by David dying. That was when David expected to be reunited. We could, get, we could digress that. I'm just saying that what about the children argument is, is a distraction at this point. People use it as an excuse. They say, what about the innocent children? All right, God knows how to take care of innocent children better than you do, doesn't he? There's no specification of an age of accountability in the Bible. So you better warn your children the moment they are really sure that they know that they, they're sinning and they're deliberately rejecting the gospel and they're deliberately carrying on. That they, God could hold them accountable. You better be evangelizing your children. God could say, look, you knew and I knew you knew. And so you need to repent, right? You need, you need to repent. Everyone needs to repent. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That's what 
Jesus said, it's not me, it's Jesus. And I'm saying it too because that's my job. Um, I take no joy in that. I watched the words of a father who was on one of the kibbutzes that was attacked the other day. And this father hid when the, the terrorists came into their kibbutz and he couldn't get to his home where his family were. Terrorists, he kept hiding and he couldn't reach them. The terrorists were walking about and whilst he was hiding, the terrorists destroyed his home. And afterwards, when the soldiers killed the terrorists and the, the, he was able to come out of hiding, he was desperately trying to find his family. He couldn't find his little girl. He couldn't find his little girl, and he was terrified. He was terrified. When they finally found her and told him his little girl, beautiful little girl, was dead, he said, yes! Because he was so relieved that she hadn't been taken to Gaza because he knows what happens to those people taken by Hamas. And I said yes with him because death for a child, death for a truly innocent is, it's, it's not hell, is it? It is. They've gone to a better place. That's true. It's a release for them. The suffering is over. Listen, if this life, if you're going to heaven, this life is the worst you will ever experience. And those blessed little children in Israel, in Gaza, those poor little children, all of them, I praise God that they go straight to heaven. But it fills my heart with grief. Does it not fill your heart with grief? To think of all those people. I look into the eyes of that man on the video, saying to me, saying to you, saying to the world, it was the best party of my life. And then in a second it went from paradise to hell. I'm thinking he's got no idea. Literally, we're living in an age when people have no idea. The word hell is gone. Where is it gone? Jesus taught about it, didn't he? Is this true or is it not? You have to reckon with that, don't you? I have to reckon with that. It's either true. We have a lot of evangelizing to do. We have a lot of praying to do. It's either true or it's false. Jesus said it. <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he was dying there for sinners, wasn't he? Which category of sinners was he dying for? Was he dying for the Jerusalemite sinners who looked down on everyone else and didn't think that they were actually anyone that God should hold accountable? Was he? Was he dying for the Pharisee who prayed in the temple that Jesus taught about, who said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I do this, I do that. Was he dying for the the people who saw themselves as righteous? No, he said, I, I did not come to save the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. Which category are you in today? Are you justifying yourself in your mind? Are you saying, but God wouldn't send me to hell because, or are you like that tax collector in the parable and you're saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. But, listen, this is the great but, isn't it? But Jesus died for sinners. 
The good news of the gospel is that on that cross, he was dying, paying the price, paying the debt that sinners like this one deserve to pay. I deserve hell. I deserve to be punished forever, to burn for my sins. And I know my sins. Maybe you don't realize the depth of yours and you think that's a bit steep. Friend, go and look in the mirror. This is the mirror. Go and find out what God says in his word about sin and how serious it is. And you'll end up not with a problem with hell, but with a problem with the idea that you're not there. Listen, the worst of sinners, the worst of sinners can be forgiven through what Jesus did on the cross. Do you believe that? There was one on a cross next to him. (laughs) Two of them, either side, one either side, and both of them were hurling insults at him, Matthew tells us, Mark tells us. Luke Mike read this for us earlier, Luke 23. Luke tells us that sometime later, one of them, one of those thieves, one of those murdering thieves, bandits from a cross, suffering on a cross, enduring agony, enduring what most people would call hell, the suffering that people call hell, here and now. He was, he was in it, right? That was his modern day version of hell. What did he say? He said to Jesus, Lord, he rebuked his friend. He said, we're suffering justly. We're suffering justly. I'm, ge- I'm only getting what I deserve, says this man. I deserve hell. And he says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, He's believing, isn't he? He must have heard something about Jesus. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You know what Jesus said? I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. That man went from his hell to heaven to paradise. It is possible, friend, to go from hell to to paradise, but it's possible only through the cross. If you don't repent, if you don't embrace that, if you don't come to God for that forgiveness through Jesus, you you, you better believe this life is not hell. No matter what you experience in this life, no matter what suffering you go through is nothing compared to what's coming father we pray that you oh god would turn our hearts back to you that you would give us grace to believe you grace to act like we believe you to pray would you please draw those who are in this room who just don't believe it could happen to them, Lord, there were 3,000 of those just the other week. And you knew every single one of them that was about to meet you that day. Well, thank you that you give us these warnings. I pray that you would give grace to everyone who hears this message to heed the warning and to seek you while you may be found, to call upon you while you are near. Thank you that today is the day of salvation. Thank you that Jesus is saving sinners still. Oh, Lord, please save some today, we pray. And hear our prayers for our loved ones, our family, our nation. Lord, you know what you've got ahead for us. We pray, living God, that you would have pity upon the nation of Israel. Yes, that you'd have pity upon all those people in Gaza who know not what awaits them. Oh God, send light. Give boldness to your servants in those places, to the Christians in Gaza. Give them courage. 
Give them courage to speak the truth, whatever it costs them, and to spread the light. Save, Lord. We pray for the people in Israel that are blind, but there are soldiers conscripted and sent into those battle fields who know you, who love you, who have embraced you as their Messiah. Lord Jesus, be with them, strengthen them, give them courage to preach the truth. We pray it all for Jesus' sake, that your name would be glorified and that you would be honored by the salvation of many souls, that hell would not be the destiny for the people that we pray for. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.